Good evening, friends. On behalf of Tata Steel Kolkata Literary Meet and Juggernaut, I would like to welcome you to a book launch of a very special book in a very special place. We are at Balo Basha, which is Nobunita Dev Sen's much fabled residence. And today we are going to launch a collection of her translated works, Nita Dev Sen's poems, translated by Nandana Dev Sen. So before we get into readings, memories, and discussions, I would like to launch the book. It's a very special moment because Nandana, <laughs> Shumon Mukhobadhyay, Onupam Roy, and our very, very special Mekla is going to, uh, we are all going to release the book. Mm -hmm. So each of you please hold the book and uh, unwrap it. Thank you. And Leila, do you want to say something in the mic? Oh, you mm. want to say happy birthday to somebody? Um, whose birthday is it? Happy birthday for um. Happy birthday, Timma. Timma. Yes. So hold the lock. Yes. So uh, this is the book we are going to discuss today. Have readings from. And uh, before we start that, we are just going to run a little montage of uh, Nobunita Di to many of us, Ma to Nanduna, and Dima to Mekla, and a video of memories of her wonderful life and her unforgettable smile. <laughs> So welcome back, and as I said, we have this wonderful panel, which is a bit of an acrobat's balancing act, because we have Nanduna giving us the perspective of a daughter. We have Shumon, who was a student to Nobunita Di and friend to Nanduna, who will talk about his memories of the poet and his thoughts about the translation. And we have a poet, Onupom, who will speak about a poet's perspective on this collection of poems, the translations, and what's gained and what's uh, different in a translation of a poem. B the other balancing act we have to do is the personality of Nobunita Di. She was somebody who had a bright, wonderful laugh, and uh, her poems often belied the joy she brought to us. So we have to balance the joy that was Nobunita Di with some of her deep, thought-provoking poems. So Nanduna said we should start with a poem that best exemplifies her mother. So she's going to read the introduction. We decided that we're going to keep our masks on unless we are speaking so that um, we can be as safe as possible. First of all, Shubho Ma, um, thank you all so much for being with us here today. Uh, I know that we have uh, participants from all over the world. And uh, it is such a, it is so wonderful to be in Bhallobasha Bari on Ma's birthday, as many of you would remember. This is the room. Amra ei ghare Mar Jonmodin Bachorer Bachor Bachor celebrate korechi. And I'm so grateful to Kolkata Lit Meet and uh, Malobika and Lalda and Onupom for, for bringing in the festivities into this room, as is. Um, most fit. So we are all missing Ma, and as Malubika rightly said, her um, amazing personality. But I'm thrilled that all of you are with us in a way in this room today. Um, the poem that I wanted to read out is uh, one of her most uh, beloved and most iconic poems. It's called Ekal Chirokal. हमको मिटा सकेंगे 
जमाना में दम नहीं गालिब आमा के नेबाते पारे एत शक्ति राखे ना समय कख भेब ना আমি সময়ের মুখ চেয়ে থাকি সময় আমার সঙ্গে খেলে যাক যুদ্ধ যুদ্ধ খেলা যতই কারুক শাড়ি লজ্জাবস্ত্র ঠিক থাকে বাকি মন্ত্র বলে বেলা হয়ে যাবে সব যা ছিল অবেলা ধর্মযুদ্ধে প্রতিবাদী চিরকাল দাঁড়ায় নির্ভয় যেহেতু সপক্ষে তার ঈশ্বর সাধিত মহাকাল স্বয়ং সারথী হয়ে সব বুহ ভাঙেন উত্তাল যতই দিক না যুদ্ধ খণ্ডকাল হবে পরাজিত এই তো জেনেছি শাস্ত্রে যতটুকু হয়েছে অধীত অখণ্ডকালের পক্ষপাত ধন্য আমি মহাশয় আমাকে রাঙাবে চোখ এত শক্তি রাখে না সময় বিফোর আই রিড দি ইংলিশ ট্রান্সলেশন অফ দিস আই ওয়ান্ট টু tell all of you how much I'm missing my Didi, Antara Devshen, who was also going to be with us today. She was going to launch the book with all of us. And uh, this is one of her favorite poems as well. She loves to read this out. So, um, Didi, I hope you can hear us. And um, I wish you could have been with us in this room right now. Right now, forever. Time has not the power to extinguish me. Don't think for a moment that I wait upon time. Let time keep on playing his absurd battle game. Every time he strips me, I rise clothed without shame. With the force of prayer, of spells magic and divine, all that was untimely will turn auspicious, sublime. In a just war, the rebel stands forever unafraid. For her ally is eternity, who, divinely arrayed, guides her chariot, destroying the enemy line. Thus, a divisive age will be defeated and spurned. Though it brings on great wars, it will lose every time. From all our scriptures, this is the truth I have learned. Know that I am cherished by an undivided, infinite age. Time will never have the power to scorch me with its rage. Um, we love this poem, uh, my Didi and I, and all of Ma's um, readers, because it is such a wonderful example of her indomitable spirit and the way she makes the story of the archetypal uh, Indian heroine of our epics into the story of every woman. Um, and I think Shumon has the other mic, so you oh, can okay. speak to that. So, yeah. so thank you, Nanduna, for that poem, which, as you said, so exemplifies a lot of the thoughts that are reflected in many of the poems you've chosen to, chosen to translate in Acrobat. Which brings me to the question, what made you choose these poems? And uh, what was, uh, you started this project when Nobunita Di was alive. Okay. So uh, just talk us through those early decisions of which poems go in. Yeah, so um, will, I, will I take that? Okay, all right. Um, so yes, we signed this book um, two weeks before Ma passed away and she was, really excited about the book. It was the first time a book of her translations was being published um, internationally. And we started making, we, sh we made a first list of poems that um, including the one that we read and actually the ones that we are all going to read together today. All of those poems were on the list of uh, that Ma made. But that was only, uh, I mean, there were maybe 15 poems on that, so the um, the rest of the selection came from immersing myself in all of her poetry again, trying to place it in a kind of chronological context for myself, which was fascinating because it felt like I was reading a kind of uh, emotional, a, a kind of a, a journal, uh, a, a her emotional history, I should say. But, um, 
So I wanted to choose poems. It was a combination of the poems that I know that she loved and she loved to read out because Ma loved going to Kobe Shom Milan's and there were certain poems that she always loved to read. Uh, so if any of those ha hadn't made it to her initial list, I made sure they were on, on, the, on my list. But it was also, I wanted it to be representative and uh, representative in terms of her 60 years of uh, poetry. So there are poems from her first book, which she published when she was barely 20, Prothom Prothoi, and there are poems from her last book, Tumi Monastir Koro, and everything in between. So I wanted it to be, and her poetry changed uh, over the years, as you would all know, because we're all artists, um, you know, your work does change as you enter different phases in your life, and that's very um, clear in my mother's trajectory as a poet. Um, the other thing was I wanted to have a combination of shorter poems and longer poems, a combination of poems. Ma, Ma was brilliant with rhymes. She was a real, she was another kind of Chandir Jadugar, and she, uh, so I knew how important it was for her to write poems in rhyme, and I wanted to, every poem that I translated uh, that she had written in rhyme, I wanted to render in rhyme. That took a lot of time, but I wanted to make sure that the choices we made represented her love of rhyming, her love of writing new, creating new words, her love of referring to our um, wealth of classical literature, um, her way of being able to be um, relentlessly honest about herself uh, in a way that could sometimes be quite disturbing and shocking. So I wanted to balance out those poems with the poems that were that showed the other side of her, which people also loved her for equally her optimistic and uh, uh, her, her personality that was so full of joy and love. So you know, combination of all of those things. Okay, so a lifetime of poetry is hard to encapsulate in even what ninety poems. <laughs> Yes, so I think the best person to go to before I come to a different aspect of Nobunitildi's personality is to stick first to a poet. So, uh, you know, there's a line in uh, which Nanduna has quoted in the introduction which says that no matter what I write, it is always a poet writing. So, uh, as a poet, as somebody who also occasionally writes uh, prose and uh, now you have a monthly column, and you write, you write songs. So, once a poet, always a poet. Is that a, is that a line that resonates with you? Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being to, here. To the evening, and a uh, very happy birthday, Navani Tadi. Jekani thago. It resonates a lot with me uh, with, when I think of. Uh, creating something or something comes to my mind, I feel uh, there's a lot of commonality between uh, artists and people who are trying to create. Uh, so, yes, I would agree to what you just said. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I want to just interject and yes. say I want to thank you for uh, coming and sharing your poetry with Ma when she was unwell and you came and with your guitar and you sang your songs and you actually shared the poetry that you had written also at that time, um, which she loved and that was just such a special uh, special day for us, so thank you. Yes. So I just wanted to ask you one more question before going to Schumann, which is uh, the, uh, you once a poet, always a poet, a poet, but is it also true that sometimes a poet is identify too much with his or her work. So any poem of pain shows that the poet is talking about himself. Does this, uh, does this kind of, uh, I mean, Yeats has said, can you tell the dancer from the dance? But is there a point at which the poet can distance himself from his work? And is it sometimes exasperating when readers can't make out the distinction? Uh, is it a tricky question, actually, but poetry to me is a very, uh, intimate thing that whenever I am writing, uh, when I'm, whenever something comes to my mind, it's usually it usually reflects my mood at that particular moment and what I am going through. 
and what I feel that moment. But there's another aspect involved to any form of art that is a performing, performing art p perspective. So if I'm reciting a poem at a certain point, it's not necessarily that I'm in the same mood in the way th uh, w which in which I was when I was uh, yeah. when I had written it, or it's same for my songs also. There are so many sad songs that I've written. But when I'm performing on stage, I have a s smile on my face and I'm singing those sad songs uh, in a different perspective. So I'm not sad that at that point. At that time, it's a performance. But when I'm writing, I think that's a more uh, intimate moment. And I usually try to be honest to myself and my feelings that time because that's go what's going to reflect and that's what's going to resonate with everyone who's listening or reading. Thanks. So, uh, Shumon, you have known, uh, you know, before I ask Shumon what I want to ask him, you know, there's a term, formidable intellectual. Now, uh, that term didn't quite sit well with Nobunita Di because she was a very, very well-respected int intellectual, but she was a friendly intellectual. So she kind of liberated you in a way that you could say silly things in front of her, and she would be very, very supportive and encouraging and optimistic that perhaps you will, the next thing you will say is not as silly. Mm -hmm. So there was a friendliness and an accessibility to her, uh, to her formidable academic avatar, which you uh, felt the full force of as her student. So can you tell us about, you know, when you see these poems, uh, how much of these uh, poems Nanduna has chosen, how many of them remind you of your of your professor. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, viewers. And it's a great pleasure and it's a privilege to be part of this discussion and the, the unrevealing of the book. And uh, whatever little bit I got the chance to read, almost 50% of this book, um, it is so engaging and so wonderfully translated. And, you know, it's rarely you can see that the the spirit of the poetry and the language together, the rhymes, the the scansions, the everything is is come coming so lively in the translation. It's, it really happens. Thank and thank you, Nandana, for you know it is it it has, I think it would have been only possible by you because you've been kind of is a you, this poetry is a part of you of your existence, you know, and it's so close to you that. It, that that the, the translations are really uh, vibrant in that way, um, vibrant as Dominita Di was vibrant and a fantastic forward um, and, and fantastic afterward. Also, your open letter to your mother and it's so touching. It's so uh, you know I think that you kind of got the spirit of Dominita Di inside you. That's important, you know. That's because um, what as a you know, that was the formative year when I was in comparative department in 1986 to 89, that time, you know. And Nobunati was a star, actually. She was a star of the department in that way. We have great, uh, you know, professors in our you know, department, but Nobunati was kind of a star. When, when, when we have we see, hearing discourses, all this thesis, antithesis, deconstructions, and huge things happening. But Nobunitati was always traveling throughout. You know, I remember that she was um, majorly absent in the department. He was traveling in USA or somebody, and he's so, I think that, but you can feel that she's in the department. When we enter the department, we climbed up to the first floor. That was the first floor where our department was. We are sharing with the English department. You can see something has changed in the atmosphere. <laughs> something is bubbling. You know, you can you can feel that. Then we will ask, is Nomonitati back in the department? You can hear the voices from the staff room. You can hear somebody is laughing very loudly. And you know, but otherwise it's very silent. It's like very intellectual discourses happening inside. You know, um, great thoughts are happening. But Nomonitati kind of... Uh, what what you, we we use this term very much in our studying that time subverts everything, uh, undercuts everything, and she goes across the intellectuals, you know that uh, you know that big uh, you know aura. Uh, aura. Yeah, kind of he kind of he breaks and with us, but what she described as dazzling smile of 
known to the, she is seeing her dazzling smile, her exuberant, uh, you know, personality, and everything. And you know, and and I will tell some nice anecdotes about her class teaching. That's very, really, that's completely different kind of, you know, teaching. You know, but we got we we from in comparative department was always. You know, habituated with professors who used to do, you know, smoke in the class, will drink tea in the class. They will, they will do something very different. Not like the entire it challenges the entire schooling. You know, your perception of you know education there in that way. But normally, they kind of transcended that also. You know, in that way because I remember in the BA she used to teach us the song of Rola, which was the 11th century French ballad. You know, that was and. And you know, most of the time, because of not being in the class, she used to do. She will do at the very last moment. She will come. She will tell all the students, "Come, we will do a seven hours, eight hours class." You know, so she will engage the class for eight hours, close the door. Nobody is allowed to go out uh, for only for you know maybe the lunch, a small lunch break and everything. And she will sit on the table. Babu hoy boshe and she will start teaching us. And and we'll have nice breaks. You know, we'll say, "Okay, now." Break, um, Shuman, you sing a song, and you 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 narrate something. You what do you know? Do you can sing? Do you remember any poetry? So we have like breaks, like one hour teaching and fifteen minutes break, and break of entertainment break. Like he will say that um, sing a song, and she used to know because of my theatre background, my singing background. So I was always Shuman sing that from song from Marit Shangbad, Meri Baba. Have you anybody heard Mary Baba? You've not heard Mary Baba. If <laughs> you want, you have to know. It. So I think that's again the in that thing the song of Rola, this 11th century French ballad becomes kind of you know sublime and kind of got um, very relaxed. And then we again go back to study. So this is how I remember that uh, th those um, few classes we had with uh, Nomanita they was uh, amazingly entertaining, and that goes inside inside you. It is not like teaching. But she can be tremendously furious also if she's needed. Like I remember in one of those classes, you know, we have this habit of in Jadapur University. Remember that uh, people used to come and do uh, um, campaigning for votes, student unions. And I remember one of this group they came in, just us. May I come in, ma'am? And she, they entered, entered and started, you know, doing their campaign. Normally they wait, 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 wait. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I didn't say yes to you coming in and then and she blasted them like for the entire class she didn't stop she thought you cannot do this you cannot do politics in like this of course and that was it when in from that day we were campaigning in the inside the class during the you know any class was stopped from that day because she actually made it sure that nobody enters the camp room while the class is going on. They can do and choose, choose, choose any time. So I think that these are the memories. I have many, many, many stories to tell, but these are the very strong memories I have. Of, of another, another thing I will tell later, second half, when I was doing Madhav Malanchi Koinna, I was doing Madhav. There's a famous play by Bibar Chakraborty. I was doing Madhav. And uh, was the play in Delhi, and I will tell that experience of what she did after watching the play. I will, I will tell that later. Okay, so yeah. that's break ke baad. But it's yeah. good to know that Nobunita Di did something which can now be called binge teaching. Yes, <laughs> I, 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 I did not know this actually. This is, yes. So it's no, a new no. concept. I mean, <laughs> binge teaching it was. Teaching yes. Good one. Good to say that. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Shubon, uh, do you think you can read some of your uh, professor's poems and uh, Nandana can read the... Should I read this John Modin and Kovita? Yes. Or yes. John Modin? Yes. Yeah. And I remember that we used to come together as a group, a class, mm -hmm. to this room only to on the day of John Modin to gift, give some gift to her and spend some time singing. Always to sing and, you know, whatever Nobunit is. Hey, Tiganga. Ti Kovita Paul. Hmm. This, this room was always full of songs on her birthday. Right. Always full of songs. Oh. Yes, it was always full of song, always full of poetry, all of, always full of her students and her friends, her mentees. It was just such a special, it would kind of become a, 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 its own universe full of light and music and celebration yeah. on her birthdays. So thank you for remembering that for all of us. She, she's always, you know, 
always jovial, always smiling, you know. So. But her poetry is something else, you know. Her poetry is, there's a sense of absence which I felt in, in her poetry all the time, which I can discuss later. But John Modiner Kobita, Tarosho Ponchanubui. Ak chokhe adhbindhu ostru jhukhe ache. Onno chok khali. Sheme ghumi ache. Naki jagorone mogno ache. Shopone monone. Shemi ghumi ache. Bambahu rekheche kopale. Dan hat thote. Jodi jege uthe e stopdho grihosthali. Sheme jagbena. Tarak chokhe ostru jhukhe ache. Onno chok khali. Ahur nishi. Tar kane baje borshar jhornar moto motto korotali. She may gumi at hake. Akchoke ostrunye. Unnochok kali. Bohudin age. Aksarka said trapezer kala. Dekichilo she may. Dujon keluli. Pakhir mutun. Ule dar take a dare bosch chilo. Charidiki mohashunno. Majkane julon. Julon. She may gumi jege mogno di banishi, trapeze shop no dake. Akchoke dulethake jol, unnochok kali. Kishundar poor Lego. Poem on my birthday. In one eye hangs half a teardrop. In the other, nothing. Is the girl sleeping or is she awake but lost in dreams, in thought? The girl is asleep, left arm flung across her forehead, right hand on her lips. If the silent household awakens, the girl will not wake up. In her one eye sways a teardrop, in the other, nothing. All day, all night, her ears ring with wild applause like a waterfall in the monsoon. The girl remains asleep, a tear in one eye, in the other, nothing. Long ago, the girl had seen a trapeze act in a circus. Two acrobats were flying like birds from perch to perch, all around them a great emptiness, and in the center, Long swings, swaying in celebration. Awake or asleep, night or day, the girl is lost in a dream of trapeze. In one eye, swings a teardrop. In the other, nothing. Okkhor. Pruti din ratri neme ele ami ta ke khunche ani. Ami tar chokhe chokh rakhi. Shokal huli pher dui chokhe shongshar jodai ude jai okkhor er pakhi. Alphabet bird. When night falls I search for him, I bring him home, I look him in the eye, and I cage language. When day breaks, once again the world wraps around my eyes, and off he flies, taking each word, that alphabet bird. Bengali, you can manage that. It's, you cannot like he or she. Gender is can be played on, but in English, you cannot do that. I know, but yeah. it's interesting. Like, there were a couple of uh, thank you. <laughs> there were a couple of uh, poems, especially including this one, and there's another one called actually Mandari, where those were key decisions, yeah. and you had to make a choice, exactly. right? Um, and this one, 
um, because it's a slightly adversarial relationship between the uh, poet, woman poet, and the ever elusive language. I decided, maybe unfairly, for it to be <laughs> for it to be male. Male, yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, I had this question for you that why it is male? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now we're going for doctor. <clears throat> This is uh, written in 1989, actually. It was just before my, when my grandmother was extremely ill. And, okay. it was, and she was, in fact, I was with, uh, sorry, I'm going to be a better student, I, I promise. Mm. Um, I need some binge teaching from you mm. about how to actually, hold the mic. Actually, mask and mic is creating the problem. <laughs> yeah. um, so she was with, we were doing, she was in, um, Colorado, in the University of Colorado, doing, she was teaching, she was the Maytag Chair of Comparative Literature, and I was with her on spring break, and we were actually doing some translations. We were translating some of her poetry along with other, she was very busy. Um, and then Dima got very ill. She had a stroke, and my mother came back, and that was in, uh, so this poem was written in when my grandmother was, was extremely ill, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. Okay. डाक्तर अर्ध शतर धन चक्षर मतन यठ दुटो भरा आपत्कालीन आश्रय एत दिन खुले जा गो ग्रंथी मुक्त हुए एक जन ओई पारे जाबंदी ए पारे जन्मे मुहूर्त थे शुभ दृष्टि पाका অতি চেনা ওই মুখ ক্রমশ অচেনা হচ্ছে দুরান্তের আলো ঝলকে পড়ে পাল্টে দিচ্ছে রং যন্ত্রণার আবর্ত এসে টেনে নিচ্ছে প্রবল ঘূর্ণিতে পঞ্চাশত বৎসরের রাগ দুঃখ উন্মত্ত বিক্ষুব্ধ ভালোবাসা এতদিনে নারী কাটা হবে এতদিনে এসেছে ডাক্তার The doctor, like a phantom guarding the hidden treasures of half a century, her two clenched hands hold in their grasp the unconditional promise of asylum. After all these years, the knot is loosening. Released from the ties, one will pass over to the other side, leaving the other a prisoner on this. From the moment of birth, the auspicious exchange of glances sealed the bond. That ever familiar face grows gradually indistinct. A light from beyond flashes upon it, changing its pallor as the vortex of pain spins into a mighty whirlwind, pulling into its twist 50 years of anger, sorrow, frantic distraught love. Will the umbilical cord be cut now, at last? Has the doctor finally arrived? Wonderful translation. Yeah. Mukhumukhi. This is one of my favorites. <clears throat> Mukhumukhi. Do actor Mukher Shamne Dandate Parina. Monehoi Mukh Dhuani. Monehoi Mukhebuji Moila Legiace. Konokono Mukh to Mukh. দর্পণের মতো স্বচ্ছ কিনা দেখা যায় স্পষ্ট নিজেকেই নিজের চেয়েও বেশি কাছে দেয়ার ওয়ান ওর টু ফেসেস হুজ আই আই কান্ট দেয়ার ওয়ান ওর টু ফেসেস হুজ আইজ আই কান্ট বে টু মিট 
When I stand before them, I feel I forgot to brush my teeth or wipe away the traces of dirt from my cheek. Because some loving faces shine just like a mirror, I can see me in them vividly, closer than even myself and clearer. Thank you. That was a beautiful poem to end this cycle on. So uh, before I come to Onupom, I just wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, you have mentioned, I think I've mixed up my notes, but there's a point in your introduction where you say that uh, your mother's uh, prose were all about her light and her poetry was all about her darkness. But you have still in this collection tried to uh, balance the darkness and the light. And uh, you've done quite a tremendous job of the choice as well as the translations. So uh, how did you, while translating this, uh, reassess the, some of the dark moments of this po these poems? Um, it was actually a, a revelation to me in a way. I mean, I knew all the poems, right? They were beautiful poems, much loved poems, much recited, much quoted poems. Um, but, uh, you know, a as a child, you don't step out of your role as a, as a daughter. You don't, you see your mother as, as, as your mother, you assume that they are completely uh, unbreakable and, um, and my mother was, she was, our mother was indomitable. She was so, she was dauntless. But she was also extremely vulnerable and she allowed her vulnerability to show in her poetry in, a, in an incredibly brave way. And I think it's only when I translated all the poetry, when I went through all of the poetry and translated this book that I realized how much of a coping mechanism poetry was for her. Uh, and she wrote at various points that if she didn't have poetry in her life, then she would have fallen apart and that poetry was a survival tool uh, for her. And I could, I, I, I could understand that so much better. Um, because, you know, when you choose, it's one thing, I mean, there are various things here. First of all, there is the way you assume that your mother is completely without a chink, right? That is, a, that, that is the sort of thing that you, as a child, and she was also someone who was so full of joy. She was always laughing, and she laughed away all of the uh, rumors and kind of lies that one would hear about her. She just dealt, there was so much strength in the humor that she had about life. Um, that, I mean, that did add to the feeling of invincibility that I felt that I kind of uh, superimposed on her. And then the second thing is when you read a poem as a reader, there is still a level of distancing. So there's the, dis there's the kind of, uh, there's the place that where you put your mother because she's your mother, then there's the place where you put her as an author because you're absorbing the poem or you're consuming the poem as a reader. But when you try to choose the words for her pain, as a translator, that becomes a very different experience because then you you become intimately connected to that pain. You inherit uh, a legacy of pain as a translator in a way that you don't either as you know as as a reader. So I think uh, it was quite intense. It was also intense going through it at a time so sh just after uh, we lost Ma. So to go through this during grieving was was in some ways intensely painful um so i th but in the same way poetry had become a coping was a coping mechanism for her i think doing this book um i it didn't feel like that at the time but looking back i can see how it was a kind of a survival mechanism for me too and the other thing that i want to say about that which was again I mean, I always knew, we always knew, and Ma wrote about the fact that her, that she 
this poem that you wrote, John Mudiner, that you read, John Mudiner Kobe, that's so interesting because she talks about the two different eyes. And she writes about it in a different way often where she writes about how one eye was always smiling and that is the why she used to write her prose and her, uh, her, her wonderfully... Um, joyful. Yes, the line you've written is so beautiful. Nobunita loved to laugh at herself in her prose, but she was never afraid to cry in her poetry. Thank you for rem remembering that. Yes, so she, she, she did, so she knew that the poetry is something that she kept for her most intimate, darkest uh, emotions. But I didn't know, for instance, um, how much anxiety she felt as a mother until I wrote until I read this because there's so many poems that are about the 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 um, responsibility of of bringing a, a life into this imperfect broken world and all the ways in which you feel uh, all the fears you feel as a mother and I don't know if I didn't get it before because I was too steeped in my role as a daughter or because I hadn't become a mother yet, but doing this, going through the, the poems as a recent mother myself, uh, those poems were so, they really revealed uh, a side of my mother's that I had, even though I had known the poems, I hadn't fully grasped. Okay, so uh, we'll come back to this point you've said about motherhood and you know many other aspects which keep recurring in her poems. But I wanted to ask Onupom, uh, you know, uh, you two in some ways fight the battle of choosing the language. Uh, many poems are there in this collection, as you may have seen, which are in English, which show what a fine poet in English Nobunita Di was. And I'm sure she was aware that would have given her a greater reach. So when you see uh, you know, this, this loyalty and commitment to Bangla, how do you respond to it? And equally, how important is a translation of this nature, therefore, to then you know, get these poems of such high quality and such celebrated works in one language into another language? I deeply respect for Namanitadi to for for sticking to Bangla for mainly uh, her literary works, poetry especially, because when we read her English poems, we understand that understand that she could have easily done that, but she chose to do it in Bangla, and I think it's a big plus for us who are trying to create something and who are living in a different generation, a different decade, different century, uh, where. English and other languages have risen and almost trying to get, get us. And uh, for a young poet who's like 18, 19 right now choosing to write a poem, it's definitely a choice that he can, he or she can either write in Bengali or in Hindi or in whatever language the person chooses. But uh, in our Bengali literature, our cultural heritage, to have poem, poets like Namonita Di uh, should encourage uh, the youth to be involved more in Bangla and uh, choose their mother tongue uh, to write poems and to understand that so much beautiful poetry has been written in this language and that should, I think, should encourage more people. Um, but at the same time, the struggle is huge. There's always the Hatsani of the West, that I keep on telling myself that Western Hatsani Chaite, but Western Hattali Chaite, Beshi Mishti, Beshi Sundar Arki Chui Nehi What about the role of the translator? Yes, so translation of any work is tremendously important to me. I am limited to Tinta language, Bangla, Hindi, or English. So whatever work, পৃথিবীতে যা যা হয়েছে সবকিছুকে এই তিনটা ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজের মধ্যে দিয়ে আমার মধ্যে আসতে হবে সো হোয়াট अबाउट দ্য अदर পারসন হু ইজ নট কনভারসেন্ট ইন বাংলা তার কি হবে সো অল দ্য বাংলা ওয়ার্ক বাংলা ওয়ার্কস দ্যাট হ্যাভ হ্যাপেন্ড আইডিয়ালি শুড বি ট্রান্সলেটেড ফর পিপল হু আর নট অ্যাওয়ার অফ হোয়াট 
ocean of literature we have in Bangla. So, uh, Navanita, Navanita, these poems, I think they deserve translation much earlier. But thanks to you, that just finally happened. And now people all over the world who are conversant in English, uh, they can appreciate what she wrote, a Bengali woman uh, starting to write at the age of 21. Pratham Pratthai was at 21. And uh, she continued writing poems till 2018. Uh, so that's a lifespan of a poet uh, who's starting to write at, at 21. And till, till her last breath, she wrote poems. And to understand her life, how it feels to be a middle class uh, woman growing up, uh, leaving the country, coming back to the country, uh, going to a university, teaching there, having students, having her own life, raising daughters. So it's a different journey and to people to understand her through her poetry, it's very important that her work got translated and thanks to Jagannatha and, uh, and uh, Nandana for translating these be so beautifully. Yes, and I think there's a good point to plug in the book. If you just go above the Facebook Live as well as the as the YouTube, you will see the link to which one can go and uh, get the book. So you just have to click on the link and buy this beautifully produced and wonderfully written translation of Nobunita, these poems by Nanduna. I think now the time is ripe for Shumon. We'll be going to another cycle of poems and translations. So Shumon can tell us about his close encounter with Nob Nobunita Di in Delhi. No, yeah, that was a very important moment in my life. You know, I remember uh, it was uh, my final year, I guess so. Uh, we're reading that poem from 1989. I think Madhub Mananchi was produced in 1988. 89, we had a performance in... Um, New Delhi in Kamani Auditorium. So I was uh, playing Madhob. Madhob was the kind of a hero of the play, a singing hero. So I have a lot of songs and everything. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long play though. So uh, suddenly in Kamani's uh, green room or the makeup room was kind of below the stage. It was like you had to go down quite a long steps down. So in the interval, intermission, <laughs> I was, I was just having my cup of tea and my cigarette, you know, that time, you know, what I'm saying. And I suddenly heard a voice, you know. And that voice, voice is recognizable anywhere in the world, you know. Normonity's voice and, you know, laugh, the smile, sound of laugh can be recognized anywhere. When any moment you hear, you know that Normonity is there. And I heard that voice just above in the staircase, you know. So, and, uh, and somebody else is trying to say in a low voice, <laughs> I think that, I mean, it's like, uh, the, I think Amyo Dev was there with her, and she, he was coming to say that it does go down long. But I know she, she has always started coming down the stairs, and, and I, I just stood up, you know, I, I didn't know she has come to watch the performance. I have no idea. And then I saw she's emerging down the stairs. Shumon, and she come and hugged me, and you know, I said, my makeup, my makeup, you know, she was touching me, and you know, ki bhalo kore chish, ki bhalo gaan gash tui bole, haat taat puro, haat hai rong tong lege galo. But Amyodev also came down behind her, and, and, and everybody kind of, or the entire thing, including Bibhasda and all the members, we have 50 members team, everybody came. To you know, watch that Ramonita has come down and then Somra Shobai Bhalo Kuchu Ki Bhalo Kuchu. And she appreciated everybody. Bibhash Khub Bhalo Lag Jamar. Well, now she said, Okay, Tumra, I am every intermission, I have to go up. She started going up and uh, I tell Ramonita, I am wrong. 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 I am She didn't walk back. So I think that's the spirit. You know, intermission, she came down and she was like, uh, I was so excited. So I, I remember that moment, one of those, you know, prized moments of life then when you when you get an appreci appreciation which is coming up completely. There is nothing, you know, nothing hidden. It right. is like so straight. And I always found that in Nobunita the in her writings, in her personality, as a teacher, as a poet, as a um, as a um, as a social uh, um, you know I, I, I would tell she was a reformer. As a feminist, I think she views as the clarity of her thoughts. Mm -hmm. Clarity, and, and she was never, uh, you know, um, the, when, I men, when I mentioned that 
I always feel felt that absence. There's this sense of absence, and melancholy, which is there in the in the poetry, mm -hmm. sense of absence, and that is felt even in the most brightest poems, poetry. I can feel that sense of absence, and there's something, there's a uh, there's a gap, there's a gap which is, and, and she never tried to hide that, and so I think that, that you mentioned that very aptly in the introduction that at one point she had stopped writing. Mm -hmm. She felt that actually what you said right now, which is very revealing also that uh, she's trying to kind of, the one of the mm, mechanism she used to quit the cope up with all the, all the pain, all the anguish, all the depressions or whatever it is, you know, the, the main. Yeah, and, but, but I always felt that, you know, from, from behind that melancholy, from that sense of uh, um, despair, you know, there's one human being who is living, who who is uh, lively, which is who is vibrant. That always there. So I think that's transcendental quality of her literature mm. is there all the time, and and that's also was in her on her character, uh, her boldness, her dexterity, and uh, man, she is always bold, straightforward. Nothing, you know, uh, you know, no ambiguity in her thoughts. She's she's direct, and but that doesn't mean. It's the ambiguity is always connected to artistry. I think that was always there. The artistic ambiguity was always there. She was never compromised on that. The artistic ambiguity, that great sense of art, which you feel from the writing, from the poetry, is always there. So uh, I was so privileged, and you know that that I was been taught by her, and and I had a chance to you know have some kind of close and to come look see her from the close proximity, you know, mm -hmm. from the proximity. That's important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I think that's Avanitadi uh, <laughs> for me. But that's I, beautiful. I, I just wanted to say that uh, Omyo Mama is actually watching this today, so I'm sure oh. he's remembering <laughs> this lovely uh, that memory that you have yeah. of yeah. coming to see the play with Ma. Thank you so much. Again, I did not know about it, and thank you so much for sharing it with us. Yes, and now it's time to share some more poems. So, uh, you, know, you keep that mind because okay. you'll have to read the translation. Oh, yeah. So, Prothom Kovita Jeta Porchi, Madari. Madari. Bhebeche, Shebuji Kup Shundor, Madari Kala Jane. Duhate Shomaike Nye, Lupa Lupi. Akhon Tokhon. Dutoi Nachabe Dumutote, Hetejabe Dorid Opode. Bhebeche, She Shop Kichupare. Zibone Agbari Shudu Dori Kepeote. Um, I could never be, I could never do any madari. I can't, I can't, I cannot even keep up like, you know, a, a mic mask. and a mask. So forget about juggling time with both hands. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wanted to go back to say, before we translated, you know, something that you said, and uh, it was a, such lovely questions that you asked. Ma was so committed to writing in Bangla because she felt, as you said, that this sort of, even though she loved the uh, writing, new writing in English, which, you know, even before it, it became a thing, she anticipated that it was going to happen. In the 70s, she knew that it was coming. And she made a choice in the 70s to keep writing in Bangla because she was worried that regional literatures would become slowly obsolete. Because, Folk literature. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and she was right in predicting something, which is that she had said at that time that Indian literature will be represented to the world through Indian writing in English. And while that is part of Indian writing, there is also uh, such a rich universe of regional literatures. And to, to properly represent the, uh, the truth of the authentic uh, face of India, you have to represent the in, uh, Indian writing in Indian languages as well as Indian writing in English. And sure enough, that has happened. I mean, if you talk about I mean, living, since I no longer have the joy of living here, um, and living in New York, when you talk about Indian writing with friends, people basically write about wonderful writers, but they're all Indian writers who are writing, Indian writers of India, writers of Indian origin who live abroad and write in English. 
So it's a very different, and I, it was so interesting. And, and she was somebody that I would call, she was a social reformer. She was a language activist as well. So this was a choice she made. She also connected to that was the choice she made of spending a lot of time doing translations herself. She translated uh, from uh, literatures across India, across the world. And she really felt very strongly that that was key not only to to uh, global reform and bringing peoples together, bringing women's voices uh, out, but also a way of correctly representing Indian literature. So this, <laughs> yes, now we're going to come to Acrobat. Acrobat. She thought she knew acrobatics rather well, that she could juggle time with both hands, play with the now right next to the then. She would make both dance, she thought, fist to fist, and she would glide so smooth along the tight rope. She thought she could do absolutely anything at all. Only once in your life will the rope shiver. So it's a conscious uh, she. Translating this poem, I was Micro microphone. One day I will I will figure this out. So I was actually translating it for this book, which is a book that I did um, when Mark turned seventy-five, and this was a surprise birthday present for her. So I tr I couldn't actually consult on the translations with her. Um, so I couldn't ask her, Mark, uh, he hobe na she hobe, because there would be no surprise then. So I. I chose this. To me, this poem always seemed like a poem about uh, the, de the, the multitasking that every woman has to go through to survive. Mm -hmm. So I chose she. When the book was no longer a surprise, I asked her, Ma, did I make the right choice? You know, what, when you wrote it, did you see the acrobat as a woman or a man? And she said, honestly, I hadn't thought of that at all. I wasn't thinking about the gender because to me, this was a poem about the delicate balancing act of a poet or an artist. Mm -hmm. But, so I said, oh, how interesting. I, it completely made sense, but I hadn't read it like that. And I said, okay, Ma, I can, I, I'll rework that. And she said, no, actually it works wonderfully also as a feminist poem, and I don't want you to change a word. Um, but when we were discussing, and Ma did choose the title of the book, uh, along with the, the first cover, this cover by Robindranath, Robindranath Thakur, um, she chose this title because she felt that the book was both about the uh, balancing act of a poet and about the multitasking of a woman, about the different identities that a woman has to inhabit. So that's why we, we chose it as the title. So which one should I read the next? Anyone? Boro Howard Part. These are poems I think she wrote in, in post-2000. That's right. Right, right. That's right. These are. This is actually from her last uh, complete collection of poems from Tumi Monastir Kaur. Yeah. This century. Yeah. So, Boro Hawar Pat. Rokto pate bhoy pas chile. Kumar jo horone bhoy pas. Ek bar rokto shad pele. Bujhi shorbonash. Chash ba na chash. Toke rokto nitto nishi dake tane. Chile, tumi boro hoye otho. जानो ना तो ओखरो कतो हिंगोस्त्र होते पारे, जीव हा कतो चोतुराली जाने, शपनो पारा पारे, की रक्तो झोराते पारे ठोंटो। Growing up lesson, boy, are you scared of bloodshed? Are you terrified of plucking virginity? If the taste of blood goes to your head, do you fear that it will be a calamity? The truth is. Whether wrong or right, your blood calls out to you each night. Listen, boy, it's time for you to grow. Words can be as fierce, don't you know? The treachery that lingers on tongue tips, beyond the world that all your dreams show, know that blood can be easily shed by lips. So, Porer Kobita, Kokuno Bhalobasha. 
এটা প্রবাসে লেখা হয়েছিল কেমব্রিজে উনসত্তর সালে কখনো ভালোবাসা ডাকলে আসে পোষা কাকাতুয়ার মতো আঙুলে এসে বসে ফরফরায় ঘাড় দুলিয়ে পালক ফুলিয়ে ঝুঁটি নাচিয়ে বুলি কপচায় মন রাখা বোল পড়ে আমার ধবধবে পাখি আমার মন রাখা যত বুলি যত শেখানো পড়ানো বুলি আমার কানে মধু ঢালে তারপর আড়ালে একা তাঁরে বসে বসে নিজের মনে মনে আমার ধবধবে পোষা পাখি ঝকঝকে শেকল বাজিয়ে অট্ট হাসে আর মহাশূন্যে পালক খসায় It comes when called, like a pet cockatoo. It sits on my finger, fluttering. It sways its neck, fluffs its feathers, swings its crest, and recites its practiced lines, uttering every pleasing word. My lily-white bird repeats to me all that it's been taught and sings best. Saying just what I want to hear, it pours honey into my ear. But behind my back, soon after, alone, perched on its base, my lily-white bird clatters its shiny shackles as it cackles with laughter, shedding feathers in empty space. Shall we shut the door? আমি পড়ি ভালো ভালোবাসা বারো চুয়াত্তর সালে লেখা এই কবিতা এটাতে ছন্দ আছে রাইম আছে যেটা রাইট 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 বাট দিস হ্যাজ এ রাইম অলসো উইথ ইউ মেনশন ইন ইউ ফরওয়ার্ড হাউ শি লাভ রাইমস আমার পড়াটা ঠিক হবে কিনা জানি না মানে আমি সেই ছন্দে বলতে পারব কি না তুমি চেয়েছিলে নিরুপাধি প্রেম অনতি গম্য আমি গেঁথে আনি লবঙ্গলতা তোমারই জন্য তুমি বুঝি চাও প্রেমের বাতাস নাতিশীতোষ্ণ আমি বইয়ে দি কালবৈশাখী ভয়াল কৃষ্ণ তোমার প্রণয় প্রযুক্ত নয় দূর বিশুদ্ধ আমার প্রণয় কিছুটা প্রণয় কিছুটা যুদ্ধ this time i got it <laughs> out of reach you asked for a nameless love out of reach i weaved you a wreath of blooms each to each you want love's tempered breeze softly sighing i blow you a dark thunderstorm terrifying your love is detached afar chased to its core my love is in part love and in part war you should write uh, you should make this into a song so then you wouldn't have to worry about whether or not you were writing it the uh, reading it the right way because you would for sure sing it the right way yeah thanks for the suggestion <laughs> i'll definitely try <laughs> so we have a couple of questions uh, i'll just choose the ones that are coming in one is from omlan chakraborty to nandana Why do you think Nobunita Sen's poems got overshadowed in the end by her prose? Was it her personal choice stroke bias? That's an excellent question, you know. She always saw herself as primarily a poet, but um there was such a huge demand for her prose and she loved her uh she loved writing about herself. She ra- loved writing about all the misadventures of this broken home. uh broken home in quotes and uh, people loved her um the spirit of her prose so she ended up writing a lot more it's a question of quantity really there was a lot it was over her body of work as a poet although it was extensive and it it stretched over uh 60 years um the sheer um uh, uh she was so prolific with her prose that there was a lot more of it for people to read um she also had a very strong 
fan following, as you would know. You know, she had this uh, this column that people would wait for every Sunday and. Uh, Pujor Shomai, you know, Pujor Shankama, the her uh, novels were a must in every, you know, people would buy those Pujor Shankas for her, uh, for her novels and for her fiction. So, but you know, this is it. So I'm glad you asked this question because there was a part of Ma that was very sad about this fact because, and she wrote about it. She spoke about how she felt that the great demand for her prose, which she also enjoyed writing, somehow uh, got in the way of her uh, flow of poetry. She kept, she always wrote poetry. She always, this was some, uh, poetry was something that she never stopped writing. Indeed, I don't think she was capable of stopping writing poetry. It was so much a part of who she was. Um, but she just, she didn't write as much of it as she wrote um, uh, in prose. And the other thing is, as we were, just, we were coming back to this uh, question that all of us have talked about in different ways, that her poetry was, there was a, an interiority, a, a darkness in her poetry, which was uh, electrifying, but also could be disturbing. Um, her prose, well, her, her prose, that were her narrative nonfiction uh, was very full of irreverent laughter and, and self-deprecation and was really, she was loved for her humility in that. Um, her prose fiction, of course, was also quite uh, political. Uh, her novels were like An Ami Onupom or you know, Baba Bhutin. They're, all, they're actually quite, uh, quite, quite serious, uh, quite dark as well, as well, but in a different way, quite intense. So I think it was a question of what, uh, what her readers wanted her to write most, um, and that's and and she, I know that she regretted that. So thank you for asking that question. I hope I answered it. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Poroma Roy Chaudhary. It's also a comment. It says, "I have been astounded by her. I guess Navanita Di's intellect and her ability to juxtapose humor and vulnerability." But she was loved across categories of readers, age, gender, educational backgrounds, etc. So, where I, I mean, I would like to ask uh, Shumon also this because he saw her as a teacher. Uh, so, both of you could answer briefly. Uh, what was the source of this abiding love that went beyond intellectual appreciation? I think Nobonitadi was never uh, was kind of uh, too much conscious of intellectual being. You know, I think that she is very organic kind of human being. You know, she was auto telling, like she was. She just whatever she you know feels, she just speaks that out. You know, that's the magic. That's why she and 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 I think that what what uh, I think she was trying to you know give that gender voice, you know, gender fluidity or whatever it is, the voice, you know. So she was taking the prose up more and more because that speaks more directly to the people because uh, poetry is very intense kind of experience for, for a reader. But it, 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 when, when he's writing in Anandu Bajar or all those, you know, uh, most popular uh, uh, outlets of uh, literature, uh, and people can actually is waiting for her to write something, and she took a f at the agenda that I have to write for for certain cause. So I think that f that cause became very important to her at one point of time. At one point of uh, so I think she was not bothered about intellectual discourse in that. At one point of time, she was. I mean, even when we she was much younger, and I think I'm mean, talking about 1986, 89, when we have seen her. In that kind of much younger Namunita Devshin, uh, she was completely, you know, in in contrast to the other professors of our department, she was a complete contrast in that way. She was like bang, and and she actually enjoys uh, her celebrity status also. That's there, and uh, she was always laughing, smiling, and you know, and she knows that people are watching her. You know, she knows that, and and she used to carry her so wonderfully. The personality, her style, her makeup, her everything was like <laughs> is there. You know that's what I'm saying. That she she makes it. She was the light of the department in that way. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Sandra, what do you think is the core of this cutting across um, cult? Um, I, I think, uh, I, I mean, this is, um, maybe this is a daughter's perspective, but I think she just had an, incre she had an extraordinary ability to love, to accept everybody. I mean, she had, and by that I mean, um, you know, I don't mean that in a sort of philosophical way. I mean it in quite a literal way. She loved us as a family. She loved her students. She loved her mentors. She loved the her showy, you know, her showy group where she started um, a, a, an association of uh, women artists and writers. She loved her readers. She would spend hours uh, answering fan mail, like because she, it was important to her to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with um, the reader. And so I think she was someone who um, was, I don't think I've met anyone who had that kind of a uh, he, tremendous gift to be able to, to give love and to be accepting and truly, um, at the same time, she also had a very strong sense of social justice, as, as you have pointed out earlier, and which came into her work in different ways. It came into her academic work as well as her, her poetry. It came into her fiction. It even came into some of her humor. She wrote all of these revisionist uh, tellings of, of, uh, of the Sita story and the stories of her uh, epics. So uh, she was... Um, she found, I mean, what was unique also is that she made, uh, there was a lot of seriousness within the humor that she wrote. She, de she tackled a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, questioning of patriarchy in her, in her, whether it was the stories about us as a family, whether it was the stories that she wrote about Shokuntala or, um, or whether it was poetry that she wrote that was much darker about communal riots, about uh, the violence against women that is such a crisis in, in our country. So uh, that was also very much a part of what she felt her role as a writer, as a voice, as a, uh, as a kind of interpreter you know, of what was broken about our world was i think uh, now is a good time we're way above time we've kind of sailed past an hour so uh, perhaps your concluding uh, extract oh, you wanted yes. to read from That's your it. little piece on do you want me to give I mine oh, yeah, no, but, yeah. okay so this would be a great point to you know this would be the best way to celebrate your writing and her works Thank you. i won't read i'll just read a uh, I'll read a couple, of, uh, just a shorter version of this. Um, a letter to Ma. It is true I was created in you. It is also true that you were created for me. Maya Angelou. My first semester in college. You arrived in between your conferences, suitcases and admirers in tow. Refusing abundant offers of hospitality in Cambridge, you shared and immediately redecorated the one and a half rooms assigned to my two roommates and me. Every morning, you stood in line in our noisy dormitory to claim your three minutes in the shower. You preferred the modern steel and glass shower stalls opposite our room to the quieter, more old-fashioned bathroom down the hall. You left after a week, just as I was getting used to finding your hip-length hair in my comb, and turning every head in the 1,000-strong Harvard Union where you swept into dinner with me, gliding in like a queen like you always did. A few weeks later, we hit midterm exams. I overslept the first day, found the showers occupied, and sprinted to the other bathroom in panic as I stumbled onto freezing tiles and fiddled with the cranky knob that spurted cold water for red and boiling for blue, something miraculously familiar caught my eye. A crimson dot of velvet 
on the narrow grey wall. Your well-travelled bindi, carefully transported from your forehead and placed beyond reach of the spray. In a flash I could hear you laugh and smell your scent. I could feel the tension in my neck melt into the mist surrounding me. That perfect circle of red gave evidence on that mildewed wall that you would always be there, far away, so close. Although there were unending demands on your time, a few years ago you had somehow managed to find several days for us to translate together my bedtime book for children, not yet. The book is a playful dialogue in rhyme between a mother and a child, a naughty little girl finds countless excuses not to go to bed while her ever-patient mother is determined to put her to sleep. The literal Bengali translation of not yet is akhonina, but you had laughed your own little girl laugh and declared, no, no, the girl must be much more emphatic. She will say, ekhunina, ekhunina. Well, this obstinate daughter of yours kept saying to her mother in the last few weeks, Ekunina, ekunina. Could you hear me, Ma? Not too long ago, I pulled a big blue book from our Kolkata shelf, right there. 365 Bedtime Stories. When I opened it, out fell a red gold rush of leaves, oaks, maples, and ferns collected in London when I was a toddler. One night, as you were reading to me about Tinkerbell, I interrupted you with a technical question. What are fairy wings made of? Butterfly wings, bird feathers, or huge petals? There are all kinds of fairies, you see, you replied, just as there are all kinds of people. Do all fairies look like you? I persisted. I don't think so, you smiled. Fairies are very, very beautiful. But Ma, I protested, you are the most beautiful person in the world. You laughed much more raucously than Tinker Bell would, as you drew heavy curtains over tall windows. Every little girl believes that about their mother, Tumpush. Well, Ma, I've grown up a bit. My world has grown up a lot. I left home as a child and I made beautiful friends who became my family. In my work, I've met many beautiful faces, walked with beautiful figures. I've fallen in love with beautiful minds. You grew up too more books published, many awards won. A few more clashes with your stubbornly loving daughters around your eyes, a few more lines celebrating years of full-throated life. More world tours, many with me when you swept me away with your infectious appetite for discovery, your limitless sense of wonder. Remember that list we made some years ago of unvisited countries you absolutely had to explore? Wheelchair in tow, we made it to most entries on that list. China, Egypt, South Africa, but not Burma. Each time we traveled, you transformed our adventures into provocative essays or best-selling books. And on every trip, we shared even more pleasures together than our plentiful arguments. Yes, we did have fights. I cried when you didn't understand. I begged you not to nag. I yelled at you when I was upset with someone else. I watched in panic as tears welled up in your ever adolescent eyes. But I am as sure today as I was that night in London that even if you had not been my mother, even if that most precious accident of birth had by rights been the beginning of someone else's story, even if I'd met you in any of your other roles as a poet, professor, painter, friend, or a stranger on a plane, you would still be the most beautiful person I could ever have met. At the end of Not Yet, the daughter asks, Ma, did you turn out the light? And the mother replies, Yes, my dear. Now, good night. So I think that's a beautiful uh, point to end this and um, as I said the details of the book are available it's a beautiful heartfelt collection so uh, do <laughs> do uh, 
do sh do share the poetry, do celebrate the poetry, do celebrate uh, my mother's lifetime of luminous poetry today. Um, uh, I'm just so delighted that we were all able to be here, um, except for my sister, Antara, who I'm missing very much. Um, I hope you're able to, you are able to hear everything, Didi. Um, so I want to thank you, Malobika, Unupom, Lalda, for making this a true celebration of her spirit, of her poetry, of her love, of of Bhalo Basha Bari, um, which is such a loved, uh, loved place, and which is so full of her still. And um, you know, we can feel her. We can feel her Bhalo Basha sitting here in Bhalo Basha. So. I want to thank all of you for um, for sharing this uh, this very special celebration of my mother's birthday and uh, and her poetry with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.